Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for being with us today. We have a fantastic event for you entitled Psychological Health and Wellbeing in the Age of COVID-19. We have an interdisciplinary panel of experts here this morning. David Kelly, the South Australian Mental Health Commissioner, Monique Newbury from the South Australian uh, Health and Medical Research Institute, Samri. We have Heidi Turbel, who is the South Australian Branch Chair of the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society of South Australia. And we have uh, Mardi Weber, a registered psychologist and mentally healthy workplaces consultant from Return to Work SA. Uh, my name's Jason. I'm a safety advisor from Safe Work SA. I'll be facilitating the event. Uh, we'll have each of the presenters run through their component and presentation. And then at the conclusion, I will facilitate a question and answer session where you, the li live audience, will have the opportunity to put questions to each of our panel members. So thank you for your attention and we'll kick off with David this morning. Thank you. Um, hi, thanks very much, uh, Jason, for that introduction. Uh, look, I'd just like to start my presentation by acknowledging that we're meeting today on the land of the Ghana people. We pay our respects to uh, elders past and present, and we acknowledge their ongoing connection to country. My, as uh, Jason said, uh, I'm one of South Australia's uh, mental health commissioners. The focus of the commissioners is on working in partnership with people with lived experience and their families and carers with providers of mental health services and NGOs, South Australian government agencies, and the broader community to support the mental health and wellbeing of all South Australians. One of the key responsibilities of the um, South Australian Mental Health Commissioners is the implementation of the South Australian Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategic Plan. That plan has three key elements. Firstly, promotion, community education and early intervention for all people in all communities to strengthen mental health and wellbeing, prevent mental illness, raise awareness and reduce stigma. The second priority of the plan is to ensure that services and care uh, which provide quality and seamless support are aligned to the needs of our community. And the thirdly, to really focus on strong leadership governance and improved outcomes in the mental health services system. This morning, I want to focus on um, navigating uncertainty in difficult times. Many of you would have been uh, overwhelmed um, over the past 12 months with the series of crises that we've faced, whether that's been from bushfires uh, through to pandemics and everything else in between. In difficult and uncertain times, we're all faced with two different sorts of stresses. There are control controllable stresses like complex technical problems or a big list of work responsibilities, which can be addressed through solution focused strategies. These are relatively straightforward. But there are also uncontrollable stresses like the COVID pandemic, like the vagaries of world events, or even a diagnosis of a terminal illness that cannot be resolved through traditional problem solving approaches. And our task here is to regulate our feelings and emotions in response to these stresses. We can't change the nature of the stress that we experience, but we can change the ways that we respond to those stresses. This morning, I want to int introduce you to three key strategies and 10 particular initiatives that can help us, the people we care for, and our work colleagues to navigate the challenges and uncertainty of COVID-19. And all of these strategies can be implemented in both our personal and professional lives. The first of these is maintaining stability through strategies that keep us grounded. The second key strategy is to support key connections with community through strategies that keep us engaged with friends, family and community. The third of our key strategies is to foster a mindset of growth by creating a shared atmosphere of hope. For the remainder of my presentation, I want to walk through the 10 strategies that lie under these three key strategies. When we're focusing on the notion of maintaining stability, we have to start with the idea of mindfulness. 
Now, mindfulness um, gets a lot of bad press these days. In some ways, it's an overused term. In some ways, it's also not well understood. But mindfulness is at the heart of our capacity to regulate our feelings in response to uncontrollable stresses. Mindfulness strategies help us to stay focused and engaged in the moment and to be open to new experiences. One particular subset of mindfulness is about grounding. And we can look at a, a range of physical and cognitive grounding techniques, such as deep breathing, such as positive self-talk, to enable us to respond rather than react to what's going on around us. And this enables us to refocus our thoughts in order to take purposeful action. The second strategy that I want to talk about is developing routines. Maintaining predictable routines during difficult and uncertain times helps to bring a sense of normality to life. And these routines might include um, aspects of healthy, healthy eating, exercising, socialising and sleep patterns. I talked earlier on about the difference between controllable and uncontrollable stresses. One technique, really simple technique that I'm sure many of you are aware of that we can use to enact that notion is the idea of a circle of control. This is about identifying what is in the circle of our control, those things that you can directly influence, as opposed to what is outside of your circle of concern, which are those things that you can't directly influence. This enables you to bring focus and purposeful action onto those things that are directly under your influence. The final element around maintaining stability goes to the notion of intentional media engagement. During difficult and uncertain times like COVID, engaging with social media and trusted news sources in an intentional manner and then consciously deciding when to engage and disengage is a really important part of maintaining stability. The second key strategy that I wanna talk about is maintaining connections with community. During difficult and uncertain times when anxiety is high, it can be really too easy for people to disconnect from their relationships and disconnect from their, their um, personal and professional uh, networks. So the first element that's really important in terms of maintaining connections with community is the idea of just making a plan to keep connected. Part of that might involve identifying the friendship groups, the professional networks, the communities of interest that are important to you and making a written plan to stay connected. The other element that I would wanna focus is that Maintaining connection can be both physical and psychological. When I'm talking about physical connection, that could be virtual, it can be on the phone, online, face-to-face, -face, through webinars like we're doing now. But we can also maintain psychological connection with the people that we care about or the people that we're connected to. By positive reflections, by um, uh, reviewing photographs together, by thinking of all those ways that we can undertake that connection internally. The second element I wanna highlight in terms of maintaining connections with community is focusing on the potential of new interests as well. If you're feeling isolated, if you're feeling cut off, maybe it's time to be looking for new groups, whether they're online or face-to-face -face, and developing new connections or social settings that are aligned to your interests. There is no better time than during the uncertainty of COVID to take a risk, to explore, and to taste test new activities and new interests. The final key strategy that I wanna talk about is developing a mindset of growth. And there are four elements that sit underneath these. The first of these is developing side-by-side -side support and shared hope. With colleagues, this is about acknowledging that anxiety, ups and downs and uncertainty are absolutely normal during periods of, our, of significant change like the pandemic. 
And this provides the opportunity to provide side-by-side -side support and to develop a dialogue of shared hope. This is not about Pollyanna optimism. In order to find a sense of hope or new possibilities for growth, it's really important that first off, we acknowledge people's feelings of uncertainty and that we understand them and that we validate them. The second element that I wanna focus on is about balanced thinking. This is important for us both in our personal lives and in our professional lives. By practicing balanced thinking, we bring negative and positive thoughts side by side together so that we can set realistic expectations for both ourselves and our colleagues. It's important through this notion of balanced thinking to highlight the good news stories as well and to actively search for and name the silver linings, that notion of unintended consequences that we've all been aware of that have arisen out of our time during uh, the COVID pandemic. I suspect that our working arrangements will never be the same again. People have discovered the capacity to be as productive as home as quite often they are in the office. So that notion of unintended consequences, silver linings, has been a really, really important part of working life during the pandemic. The third element of a mindset of growth is looking for growth opportunities. If you're a supervisor, if you're part of a work team, role model and talk out loud about how you look for growth opportunities or look for the life learnings to try and make sense of things outside of your control. Take personal responsibility for role modeling a growth versus a mixed mindset in your workplace. And the final element that I wanna talk about today is connection with nature. In recent years, there's been a really strong emphasis on the positive well-being and psychological benefits of immersion in nature. So connecting with nature and reflecting on how everything is adapting and growing in changing circumstances is a perfect metaphor for um, thriving during the COVID pandemic. So I encourage you and your family and your friends and your work colleagues to look for small daily opportunities to connect with nature. I have no greater joy at my life in the moment than being in my garden and seeing seedlings sprout. As I mentioned, it's a perfect metaphor for the pandemic. Everything grows, everything changes, nothing stays the same. But it might be as simple as just going for a walk or heading to the beach or for a walk. Today, I've talked about three separate strategies that can help support you, your family, and your work colleagues and work teams through difficult, uncertain times like the COVID pandemic. Maintaining stability, supporting connections in community, and mindset of growth are three overarching strategies that can help you, hopefully, and your colleagues um, maintain your equilibrium and thrive during the COVID pandemic. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, David, and very informative presentation that I'm sure we all got something out of. And next, I'd like to welcome Monique Newberry. Thank you. Thanks, David, and thanks, Jason. And thanks for, um, for having me today as part of Safe Work Month and also being October Mental Health Month. Um, I'll just see if the slides are, are showing as I'm, as I'm getting ready here. And I'll just do a, okay, here we go. Um, my name is Monique Newberry. I'm a co-lead of the Samri Wellbeing and Resilience Centre. Uh, for those of you who don't know much about our work, we uh, were officially launched in 2015 um, as part of Samri. And our vision is a society where all people are equipped with skills to build their mental health and grow through life's challenges. And I think, as David mentioned, it's fair to say 2020 has been, you know, has not been short of its challenges. So, you know, COVID-19 really has brought to the forefront the need to build mental health, uh, both in our workplaces, but also in our communities and across broader society. So our work, sorry, I'm just, whoops, going a bit 
bit ahead with the clicker here. Um, our work focuses on, we deliver mental health and resilience skills training. We also have online tools, including measurement and a mobile application. Um, and importantly, we have an in-house team of researchers which, who are constantly feeding back into our services the latest evidence and latest um, excuse me, research um, to make sure that the impact of our, of our products is, um, is up to date. So I just want to pause here and uh, talk about what we mean when we say mental health. Um, so I think, you know, as David mentioned with mindfulness and there are other terms like resilience and well-being and mental health, often they're, they're I won't say overused because it's good that we're talking about these things, but um, mental health is a term that's commonly spoken about. What we mean when we talk about mental health is it's not just the absence of mental illness. So mental health, um, and we align to the World Health Organization definition of mental health, in that it's a state of well-being where people are able to realize their abilities, feel good, cope with stresses of life, and as we say, grow through the, the stresses of life, work purposefully, and feel a sense of belonging in the community, and really about um, feeling a, a meaningful contribution in our, in our lives. That's what, um, it's, a, it's a much broader definition for mental health, not simply the absence of illness. I really wanted to, um, to, to have that as a key, key takeaway message at the beginning. So why build mental health? Um, it's really important that our workplaces focus on, on treating illness for those that do have uh, symptoms of mental illness. It's really important that we continue to do all of that work, which has come a long way. So we're absolutely um, not saying to not focus on illness. That is a criti critically important part um, of, of the mental health journey. But why, why also focus on building what we call mental health and the, and the aspects of, of wellbeing and mental health? Well, we do know from the data and the evidence that having low wellbeing can make someone eight times more likely to develop a mental illness. Um, so they, building mental health, we know, has a, um, has a direct impact on the likelihood of then suffering illness down the track. And if we think about this, um, you know, if we think about some other risk factors in the workplace, for example, whether they be physical risk factors, we're very, um, it's, it's, it's quite easy to, to then implement a, a response to those physical risk factors, whether that be on a safety site or a construction site. Um, but more work needs to be done in terms of responding to this risk factor for, for, mental, for building mental health. Um, as I've mentioned here, for, as an example, we know that smoking has a two to four times um, greater risk factor uh, for people to, um, who may then go on to develop heart disease. And we think about the public health messages that have been implemented for, for, for something like smoking, um, not just for heart disease, but also smoking links, of, of course, to other elements like lung cancer, et cetera. Um, but really, we, we are now wanting to raise the conversation to say for an eight times um, risk factor for mental illness, what more can we be doing, whether that be in our workplace, our, our communities, our society in general, what more can we be doing to build mental health? Um, and just to, to touch on there that um, there are 30, we know again from the data that there are 30% of people across society that do fall into the category of low wellbeing. That's a, lar that's a really large percentage of people in our society. And that's on top of the 20% of people who are experiencing mental illness. So, um, so, the thir so there's, a, there's a great deal that can be done for the 30% of, of people. Um, we and I'll talk a little bit about about some of the evidence-based ways that we can um, that we can build well-being and build mental health because at the moment there really isn't a great deal out there for the 30 percent. We are doing some great things with the 20 percent, um, and the conversation is starting to shift more to the to that 30 percent with low well-being, and and that's encouraging to see. And particularly COVID has made that more. Um, has brought that to the forefront. So what else is the data telling us? Now the data that, that we've collected across this year, not surprisingly, March and April, we saw that four out of five people were showing low, um, were showing low wellbeing. So that's um, or um, above mild distress levels. So that was previously about 50% of people, as I just mentioned, the 30% and the 20%. In March and April, when COVID hit, 
that jumped to four out of five people. So there was an immediate impact on people's well-being when um, at the beginning of COVID. Um, that did start to trend towards normal levels by June, but then that um, it dipped again when the Victorian lockdown started. And, and um, most of this data at the moment is collected in South Australia. So even seeing what other people are going through, uh, you know, our neighbours in Victoria, or whether that be, um, you know, a, other challenges that had um, an immediate impact on our well-being as well. Now we're currently um, analysing data at the moment to see how uh, how is how is the state, but also nationally, how are we tracking? What changes um, have been occurring? And um, and I'll just mention here that that, that this for Mental Health Month, um, there is an opportunity for anyone to go on and complete their own mental health check. Um, if anyone is interested. I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of this presentation. You can find information at bewelltracker.com and that's how we are tracking uh, data around our society's wellbeing. Um, the, so Superfriend has released um, a fantastic report recently, the indicators of a thriving workplace. Now, one of the things that I found really interesting from, from that report that was only just released, I think, last week is that mental health concerns are the most common reason for lower productivity this year, affecting three in five workers. So we know that there is a direct link um, between productivity in the workplace and, and, and mental health. And again, a reason for build for focusing on building mental health, um, not, not just waiting until someone is experiencing high distress. Um, as David um, um, also touched on, you know, people are, uh, people bring their whole, but people are, are, are a whole being. So it's, um, Previously, there has been some great work to respond to some um, uh, to some factors in the workplace alone, which again is really important work around work design and work factors. That's absolutely necessary for sure. But what we also know is we bring our whole selves into the workplace. So we do need skills um, that also help us deal with things that may not be happening necessarily directly in the workplace, but have a direct impact on how we perform at, at work. And it's fair to say that if we care about business performance, we must care about our people's mental mental health and well-being. There is no that they're not mutually exclusive. It really is one in the same. If we care about our business getting through these tough times, then caring about our people's mental health is is a big part of that. So the good news. Um, we know that there are evidence-based tools and offerings that can do this work and that we can learn how to build our mental health. There are many different um, strategies out there. David has done a brilliant job this morning at, at walking through a number of, of those strategies. Um, and, and there are many different programs. One of the programs that we launched this year as an example is called Be Well Plan. And, that, and more information can be found at the, at the site bewellplan.com. And Be Well Plan is, um, is a, a, a program that we've been developing for a couple of years now. Our research team did a review of the global literature around what activities, um, uh, what activities have the most evidence and most, um, most impact in building a person's mental health and wellbeing. And we've collated that evidence and, that acti and, and those activities into this program called Be Well Plan. And, and some of them, and many of them actually, um, David has also walked through um, in terms of the evidence is clear that, that we know mindfulness is a, is a really important part of building well-being. We know that self-compassion um, is, is important. We know that there are other um, evidence-based strategies around gratitude and, and other examples um, that people can draw on. Um, so I've, I'll just I've briefly mention that, um, and just and just quickly, our initial data from a pilot test of of Be Well Plan. Um, I, I won't go through the sort of graphing there um, in in detail. It's really suffice to say that our early data is showing um, a, a moderate effect size. So in the, in the sign in the you know psychological or scientific language, what we mean by that effect size um, is that the impact on people's level of distress and wellbeing is significant. So the good news is we know that there are things that, that can work to help people. 
Um, and most programs we've seen in the past would have what they call an effect size of 0.2. We're starting to see a 0.5 to 0.8 effect. Um, again, that's just a way of saying that there's some early, it's early data, but there's some early indications that these strategies um, that I've just touched on and also uh, David touched on a few as well, that they, that, that they work, um, which is promising, especially during this, this tough time of, of COVID. Um, so this data was collected during, um, during this year, during COVID, which is promising. Um, as I mentioned earlier, for October Mental Health Month, we are offering the Be Well Tracker for free for an individual to be able to go online um, and take, a, take a, a, a survey. It's a completely confidential assessment. No one sees anyone's individual data and it immediately tells you how, how you're going in terms of your levels of wellbeing, resilience, general health, stress, anxiety, and depressive symptoms. Um, so there's some really uh, good feedback for an individual to, uh, to immediately see how they might be tracking and also access a number of links and articles and videos from this, from this platform to be able to, um, to utilise as well. And I think I'll, I will leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. <clears throat> Fascinating research there coming out of Australia across all of the, uh, the jurisdictions. Uh, now we have Heidi. Um, welcome, please. Thanks, Jason, and thanks, Monique and David, for your contributions to the discussion this morning. Uh, my name's Heidi Turbel. I'm a certified professional ergonomist and an occupational therapist, and currently I chair the South Australian branch of the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society in Australia. Part of our role is to assist uh, work or companies or, or individuals with looking at the fit of the work to a worker's physical capabilities. And within the context of looking at um, psychological health and wellbeing, uh, we're well placed to provide some advice to employers around how we can look at that, that fit um, in the, the workforce. So today, if we're looking at psychological health and wellbeing, um, I'm going to be talking about um, a perhaps not as well understood uh, phenomenon of looking at the relationship of psychosocial factors and the incidence of musculoskeletal disorders. Uh, and I'll also be talking briefly a little bit about um, some of the ergonomic aspects of working from home as well, which many of you might be doing, uh, continued on a full-time basis or maybe on a part-time arrangement uh, as we speak. So um, if we look fundamentally at, hang on, sorry, I'm just gonna bring up my slides here. There we go. Um, so if we look broadly at um, what are some of the causes of work-related musculoskeletal disorders, fundamentally, it's a mismatch between the work demands that are being placed on the worker and the abilities of the worker to be able to cope with those demands. So it could be uh, conceptualised as the amount of load which is being placed on the worker and their abilities or limitations that they might have. So we have this, this issue of too much strain being placed um, on a worker. Now, within the context of looking at some of the physical factors that are very well known as their relationships to um, causing or, or increasing the risk of musculoskeletal disorders, we have high force, repetitive force, uh, workers being in awkward postures, sustained postures, uh, exposure to vibration, and being in a situation of being exposed to those for longer durations of time. However, there are uh, elements of these psychological or what we more broadly say psychosocial factors that also have an influence over that area. And I believe we've, we've touched uh, briefly on those a little bit. And I believe Marty will probably be talking to these a little bit more when she speaks uh, later on. But we have elements of um, uh, high work demands, uh, people that would have a low degree of uh, control over what they do in their job roles. There may be elements of low support from supervisors or managers in their work. Um, it could be monotonous or meaningless work um, to the individual, time pressures, conflicting um, demands that are being placed on people, uh, poor job design, 
um, also looking at low recognition or reward for the work or effort that people are putting in and looking at perhaps relationships with co-workers. And there was also elements of looking at, at night work and the, the initial demand that that places on a worker in, comp um, in comparison to, to regular work during the day. We then look at the, the context of those um, from um, that combination of many of those factors being brought together. And we look at um, a job that might have some very high work demand levels, the aspect of having also on top of that maybe low degree of control that the worker may have, and also that lower degree of support that might be uh, contributed from a, a supervisor. And the combination of those three factors together really elevate the what we call the stress response of the individual in those types of, of work arrangements. So um, Professor Wendy McDonald from the La Trobe University has done a lot of work in this aspect of looking at the relationships between the development of work-related musculoskeletal disorders and the psychosocial or organisational factors that can have great influence. So I wanted to present um, the conceptual model which she has uh, presented here. So at the top on the right we have the, the work um, factors that the, or the, the load that is being placed on the worker on the, uh, the, sorry, the right hand side, we have the individual factors. So we might have the strengths and capabilities or just the ability to um, cope with those demands. And we see a bit of a, a mismatch between those two uh, different elements. That then leads to effectively a um, effective response uh, in the individual in their ability to cope with those demands. And where we see um, an element from a biomechanical load that's being placed on their body, we would expect there to be fatigue and maybe tissue breakdown um, in the form of muscles, tendons, joints, ligaments, etc. We also have this stress response relationship that goes on as well, and that affects the autoimmune system. Uh, the, the endocrine system and behavioural changes as well in the individual. So if we look fundamentally what's going on inside our bodies when we're having a stress response and its relationship to musculoskeletal disorders, we can see that there can be an um, increase in muscle tension that's experienced by the worker. We can also see an increase in inflammation in muscles and tendons as a part of the response. There can also be a reduced capability of um, a muscle tissue that is perhaps damaged in its ability to repair itself and also uh, a delay in the time frame that it takes for that rebuilding or repair work to start kicking into to gear, so to speak. Uh, and there are also elements of uh, being um, uh, increased signalling of pain symptoms that are being channeled through to our brain. So our experience of pain is heightened when we're in the midst of this stress response that could be related to these psychosocial factors that I've obviously spoken about. So many workers or sorry, employers might uh, quiz us on uh, understanding the, the relative influence of these psychosocial factors in comparison to the more physical factors that we most commonly know about. And uh, there's been a great deal of research looking at, at both of these elements. And um, there was a, a large body of work that looked at all of the research that had been done across the world, looking at work-related musculoskeletal disorders and pulling out the themes of the influencing factors around the physical hazards and the, the psychosocial um, factors that had influence as well. And this uh, diagram here or graph helps to depict the relative influence of those two kind of groups of factors. So they looked at um, the prevalence of lower back uh, injuries and also in upper limb injuries. So it could be anything from the shoulder down to the, the hand and forearm. Uh, if we look just at the, the physical factors, there was a relative influence of uh, up to 80% of the, the influence of the physical factors and for the upper limb, 95% of the, the influence. However, if we look at the psychosocial factors, we had for the lower back, six, up to 63% were related to psychosocial factors or 84% for upper limb uh, type disorders or conditions. So we're not taking away that there's a, a small or insignificant influence of these psychosocial factors when we're talking about work-related musculoskeletal disorders. And that's really the emphasis that I want you to be taking out of this discussion. If you have issues in your workplace um, or you personally might have a, a, a musculoskeletal uh, disorder, um, consider the, the influence of the, the stresses that might be uh, playing a role and perhaps consider that there might be some more work 
that could be undertaken in those psychological or, or psychological health or mental health space that can also have the effect of helping drive down those um, musculoskeletal disorders um, and their prevalence in your work. So if we're looking at preventing musculoskeletal disorders, that's a whole other topic in and of itself. Uh, but fundamentally, we're looking at trying to design work which is, is good for people, both in a physical sense and in a psychological and social uh, capacity as well. And that is also brought in by looking at the culture within the workplace and its support for individuals, as Monique and, and David were saying, um, in, in all factors of, of bringing yourselves uh, to work, because that will fundamentally improve worker comfort and productivity, which will be great for any company's bottom line. So I just wanted to quickly move on to looking at how many of you might be um, working from home still, whether it be in a full-time or part-time capacity and talk about some of the elements of the, the ergonomics of, of working from home. Um, I think most of us have, have um, perhaps experienced that uh, at some point. And, and whilst there are aspects of the, um, the physical setup of, of where you're physically working at home that is important, uh, it's also uh, important to consider some of those psycho, um, psychosocial factors as well. So very briefly, if we touch on some of the, the physical factors that um, we might come into play, um, you know, we don't necessarily want to be uh, working on the couch at home or in bed propped up with a laptop for long periods of time. Uh, we want to find a good desk that has got a nice amount of space for our, our computer, laptop, and whatever the, the common resources that we would need um, to conduct our work. Uh, the, the height of our desk is really important. And I acknowledge that might, many people might be uh, thinking about um, that they're working from their dining room table or maybe their kitchen table. And it's worth considering that those, those types of tables are generally quite a few centimetres taller than your standard office desk that you might work at um, in the office. So with that, we need to look at the importance of the, um, the height that our chair that we're sitting on has in relationship to um, the work that we're providing. So having a good supportive chair that not only supports our, our back and our, our overall posture, we want to look at the relationship of how high we're able to sit in relationship to the desk that we're actually sitting at. And that good rule of thumb that you can sort of see in the diagram there is, is broadly looking at, at sort of elbow height um, if we uh, look at the relationship there. However, we're sitting at potentially a little bit higher desk or table, we also need to take into consideration whether our feet are touching the ground. So it's always great to have some foot support underneath our feet um, wherever we're sitting. If we're then looking at our, our monitor and, and laptop uh, position that we might be working on, some of you might be having an external monitor that you're viewing uh, at work. And we want to consider um, that that's a, a better scenario to lapt rather than just working directly off a laptop itself. Um, working just on typing on a, a laptop is only really a, a sort of fairly short term um, consideration that we want to uh, promote. So it's better to either have your laptop, as we see here, actually lifted or raised in some sort of stand uh, or having that external monitor uh, plugged in. Uh, lastly, it would be also looking at the elements of having an external keyboard and mouse, which can be more comfortably positioned directly in front of you to avoid some awkward postures of, of reaching and so on. Um, most of us are probably using mobile phones rather than landline numbers now, so certainly take advantage of the hands-free nature of, of using the mobile phones and take advantage of the fact that in your own home, you can actually stand up and walk around while you're talking to somebody, um, which is a great advantage rather than, than working around uh, in the office environment. So some of the other aspects as far as lending to that, that psychosocial um, um, aspect of, of working from home, is as Monique and David, you know, that it's really that connection or that, that those relationships that we really want to focus in making sure. It can be isolating working from home potentially. Other people might really be enjoying the fact that they, they don't have the distractions of other people in an office environment. So it's creating that balance of blocking out the noise and distractions that we, we can uh, experience when we're working from home, but it's also having that level of connectedness so that you are staying in contact with your work colleagues, whether it's formally as part of your work or a little bit more as, I suppose, social engagement and catching up on, on what they're uh, doing. Um, 
for myself, I know that I might, if I've got a phone call that I need to make, I will, as, as David suggested, go for a walk outside in nature and still make that phone call, but still feel the, the experience of being connected with nature uh, as well. So that's it from me uh, with regard to looking at those psychosocial factors. I hope that has given you a degree of uh, informed um, uh, knowledge on looking at that relationship of the musculoskeletal disorders and that overlay of, of the psychological health and wellbeing. But if you'd like to learn any more of that, certainly feel free to reach out at us at the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society um, to learn more about how we could potentially assist you. Thank you. Thank you very much to Heidi. Fantastic. Some extremely uh, informative and practical information there. And uh, now I'd like to welcome to the lectern, Marty Weber. Thank you, Jason. Welcome everyone. Um, and thank you for having me today uh, during Safe Work Month and also uh, Mental Health Week. Uh, my name's Marty Weber, Mentally Healthy Workplace Consultant at Return to Work SA. I think uh, we've heard some great um, speakers today um, and what I'd like to focus on is really the influence that the workplace can have in relation to workplace health and wellbeing. And we do spend a considerable amount of time at work uh, and I think now more than ever uh, with the challenges that we've faced this year, um, the importance of workplace mental health has never been um, so important. Um, to workplaces have had to adapt really quickly to change. Um, they've had to address um, significant hazards and risks to keep staff safe and supported as at the same time consider business operations. I really believe now is the time for workplaces to reflect on a new normal where workplace mental health and wellbeing is prioritised and it becomes the way we do things around here, really meaning that it becomes part of workplace culture. Uh, I've been at my role at Return to Work SA for about four and a half years now and I've found that a lot of workplaces really want to take action when it comes to mentally healthy workplace. A lot are doing so, uh, but there are also some workplaces that find they're not quite sure where to start or maybe they're a little bit overwhelmed by the amount of mental health and well, uh, wellbeing information that's out there and sometimes it can be hard to navigate. So the good news is that there are simple and effective actions that workplaces can take uh, to promote mental health and hopefully I can share some of these ideas with you today. As Monique talked about, she talked about the definition of mental health, so I'm not going to go through that again. Um, all I would say is that um, it's really important that the workplace can be a really positive contributor uh, to our mental health and wellbeing. And we really want to build an environment where it can um, support people's good mental health. So why take action? Why take action when it comes to a mentally healthy workplace? Basically, it benefits everyone in the workplace. It's really beneficial for all staff. You're pro providing great places to work in. It means that workers are gonna be more engaged and motivated, morale's gonna be higher, workers feel supported, respected and valued. It's a really inclusive work environment. And there's a sense of community, people checking in on each other and they're really supporting each other beyond just getting the job done. From a business perspective, it's actually beneficial for business. Because you're creating great workplaces to be at, you're att attracting and retaining uh, the best workers. It assists you in meeting legal obligations from a health and safety return to work, disability discrimination legislation. And also research clearly shows that it's good for business. So there's this improved productivity reduced absenteeism and workers' compensation claims. And certainly what research says is that where you do invest, there is definitely a positive return on investment. So what is a mentally healthy workplace? Basically a mentally healthy workplace is a workplace where we do provide just as much importance on mental health as we do physical health in the workplace. And the latest research is saying that it needs to be an integrated approach in relation to building a mentally healthy workplace, which consists of three aspects. 
uh, building the positive or promoting the positive aspects of work and building those positive workplace cultures. Preventing harm, so managing those risks that can impact on the mental health and wellbeing of staff, uh, those psychosocial risks that Heidi talked about. And then supporting people with mental illness, uh, mental health conditions, irrespective of cause, whether that be work-related or non-work-related issues. So in my role, um, I have, as I've said before, I've seen workplaces take uh, quite a few uh, lots of actions in relation to a mentally healthy workplace. And I wanted to talk about some of those actions that I've seen in workplace based on those three uh, key areas that we, I've just spoken about. So in relation to promoting the positive, the positive aspects of work, uh, what I've seen in workplaces is certainly that positive leadership. Leaders showing visible commitment to mental health and wellbeing, talking about mental health, both from a personal and a business perspective, launching mental health policies and strategies, role modelling mentally healthy workplace behaviours on a day-to-day -day basis. So being respectful, being supportive, being inclusive and checking in on workers on a day-to-day on -day basis, as I said before. The other part of promoting the positive is really building strong connections with the workplace and the team. And I think this is an area that businesses have really worked hard on this year. Uh, we've had uh, workers, whether they're working from home, some people working in the office, we've had people working in isolation. And workplaces have really looked at uh, ways, creative ways to stay connected with people. And I think we've all uh, learnt this year about different virtual platforms and technologies and ways that we can keep connected. And in fact, uh, it's interesting, um, Superfriend, um, uh, Monique uh, mentioned a Superfriend and uh, indicators of a thriving workplace. And their 2020 report that's just come out has actually send, uh, said that connectiveness has actually increased this year during the COVID pandemic. And I think this shows uh, the fact that workplaces have really worked really, really hard in relation to that area. Um, I think another area of promoting the positive is focusing on people's strengths and capabilities and celebrating achievements uh, and praising efforts. And it can be as simple as just saying thank you for a job well done. And finally, consulting with staff, really finding out what's important to staff to create that positive and thriving workplace, taking those considerations on board and thinking about how those actions can be implemented at workplace level. The second area is in relation to preventing harm. And this is really saying that it's about a workplace and looking at their WHS program and thinking about well, what are the psychological and physical hazards uh, that workplaces are facing and, and making sure that uh, workplaces are addressing those issues, uh, uh, putting in controls to actually eliminate or minimise risks. It is a case of don't uh, set and forget. Um, certainly during COVID, we've seen lots of changes happening within workplaces. And it does mean that hazards and risks within workplaces uh, may have changed this year. So in relation to psychosocial hazards and risks, um, Heidi talked about working from home and maybe there's more of a sense of isolation that needs to be addressed. Um, changing, managing change means that perhaps there's changing responsibilities and restructures within organisation. Or perhaps if you're in the caring sector, there's been increased emotional demands when dealing with uh, residents or, um, or uh, your patients. So all of those things need to be considered and workplaces need to actually address those issues to make sure uh, that um, uh, risks are minimised um, or uh, eliminated. Um, I think the other thing about preventing harm, again, it comes back to good workplace culture, is about having reporting systems in place, but also about having psychological safety. And that means that staff and workers can raise issues or concerns. So if there are workplace stresses, maybe if workloads are getting a bit too high, that they can actually talk about those issues and concerns with their manager and supervisor early, uh, rather than let things um, uh, not be addressed and escalate. So we really want that psychological safety within workplaces where people can raise issues without the fear of stigma and discrimination. 
For managing illness, uh, we know that at any given time, at least one in five workers are likely to have a mental health condition. And we know that during the pandemic, um, a lot of people, there are a lot of stress and struggles, and that's gonna flow through to workplaces. So the importance of workplaces having those everyday are you okay conversations, making sure that managers and supervisors do have the skills and confidence to be able to approach someone, have a conversation and connect them to the supports that they need. Or maybe having peer support in place such as mental health first aiders, which a lot of people are putting in place at the moment. Certainly promoting uh, support services. So if you have an employee assistance program, if you're a larger workplace, making sure that staff are aware of the employee assistance program, how to access it. Or if you're a smaller business, uh, making sure that staff are aware of free support services such as Beyond Blue or Lifeline. Um, having good return to work processes in place to support people back into the workplace, whether they have work related or non work related injuries or illnesses, and also raising the level of information and education around mental health within the workplace to break down stigma and to really send the message that it's okay to talk about mental health in the workplace as we do physical health. And, and as I said, this, this week, this month is a fantastic opportunity to really start talking talking about mental health and wellbeing uh, with uh, workers. The other thing about uh, a mentally healthy workplace is about taking action for yourself. And we've really heard about this from um, David and Monique today about um, the strategies that individuals can take to focus on their own mental health and wellbeing. So it's really just to reinforce about being a role model. Everyone can be a role model when it comes to a mentally healthy workplace by looking after your own mental health and wellbeing. Um, it's, I guess, boundaries of, uh, are quite blurred now between uh, work and home. So it's really making sure that we do keep our work hours in check uh, we really do have some time to switch off and recharge uh, ourselves at the end of the day and on our weekends and we can get out um, and uh, enjoy nature uh, as our presenters have talked about today. Um, definitely about staying connected with a support network, whether that be your family or friends, or if you're a small business owner, it could be a business mentor or another business owner that you can talk about business successes or worries or support options are available. And of course, we've talked about today some ways to maintain a healthy lifestyle through exercise, healthy diet, good sleeping habits, and having that time to relax and unwind. And David talked about the um, importance of mindfulness as well. And of course, really, really important for any of us um, to really seek formal, more formalised support if needed, if we really find that we are stressed or struggling, uh, to reach out, whether that be through uh, supports available through your workplace, uh, free community supports, or through your local GP. Um, and because we're talking about uh, the uh, coronavirus uh, and psychological health, um, just to let you know, there are coronavirus mental health support lines uh, through SA Health and also uh, Beyond Blue as well that anyone in the community can access. And I certainly encourage you to have a look at the Be Well Tracker as well that uh, Monique talked about. The other thing uh, I just wanted to talk about was the fact that the good news is if you do want to take more action when it comes to creating a mentally healthy workplace, you don't have to start off with a blank piece of paper. There are so many fantastic tools and resources out there that are evidence-based uh, and that really can assist you uh, in this area. So I just wanted to go through a few today, not in detail, but certainly uh, some that you can have a look at uh, after the session uh, and think about how it may assist to meet your needs within your workplace. So it certainly heads up can be a really good starting point overseen by Beyond Blue, uh, has some really great resources in relation to creating a mentally healthy workplace and a specific section for small business if you are a small business owner. Ahead for Business uh, supports those working in small business to take action on their mental health and wellbeing through their new digital hub, providing tailored resources, peer support, checkups, and personalized action plans. 
super friend i absolutely love super friend super friend is very much about um, how can we actually make workplaces thrive? And they've come up with 40 indicators that, that are indication of what makes workplaces thrive and, and five domains. Uh, and for the last four or five years, they've done a survey. And as I said before, the 2020 survey has just been released. Um, and I'm currently reading through that at the moment myself. If you're interested in having a look at and, and uh, checking in with staff, thinking about those are you OK conversations, uh, but maybe you're a bit nervous, not sure how to go about doing it, then jump onto the are you OK website uh, because they've got four simple steps to be able to have that conversation. If you're interested in mental health first aiders within your workplace, uh, then have a look at the Mental Health First Aid Australia website. And finally, Safe Work Australia has really good information in relation to work-related psychological health and safety. And I just realised, oh, I've just seen um, come through with National Safe Work Month, uh, a new fact sheet in relation to psychosocial hazards, as well as some case studies uh, in relation to mental health. We've also got resources on our Return to Work SA website. Um, certainly, if you are interested in more information in relation to mentally healthy workplace, don't hesitate to email me on mentallyhealthy at rtwsa.com. And we also run free skill building workshops, which you can have a look and check out our events uh, that we're running currently. The final slide then is looking at a practical way forward. If you're thinking about taking action in relation to mentally healthy workplace, here's a few ideas as far as how to take action. I think first of all, definitely make sure your leadership are committed and on board and recognise the importance of taking action. Secondly, consult with staff get their buy-in and input, what's important to them to build a, a positive and a thriving workplace. Do a stock take, think about what you're already doing and then identify some other areas that you wanna take action in. Do your research. There's so many fantastic tools and resources that can really help you to take action. And then finally, consider embedding workplace mental health into existing systems because I think if we do that, then it actually sticks. And what do I mean by that? I mean, look at wellbeing, think about building it into your WHS committee meetings, your toolbox meetings, your induction programs, your staff education calendar, your performance management conversations. And finally, make a start, um, make it realistic. It's okay to start small and build from there, but. Um, generally, even one action can really make a big difference within a workplace. So thank you. Thank you, Marty. And I'd just like to thank each of our panel members uh, for their great contributions today. Uh, extremely informative. We've looked at research, we've looked at uh, resources that are available, lots of practical advice for workers and businesses. I should mention that this webinar is being recorded and it will remain available online, which will be accessible for a limited period of time. So should you wish to watch it again, or should you wish to recommend it to a colleague or another business, if you think that they'd get something out of it, please do suggest to them that they check out the recording. Uh, concluding today's event, we have a bit of a, a Q&A with the panel members and we have received questions from the live audience. So uh, I'll relay them to the panel members now and uh, we'll get some robust discussion happening. Uh, so just to begin with, I'll, I'll try and uh, avoid um, <laughs> stepping into the camera's vision. I'm not quite sure how to do this, but I might just bend the microphone this way just for the moment at least. Uh, Okay, fantastic. I'll just read aloud some of the questions and, and, and some of them we have already touched on, um, but I think perhaps it's just a matter of distilling some of the information that's been given. So one of the questions, uh, and we've touched on this a bit today in each of your presentations, uh, are there any additional psychological health and wellbeing resources of information and support that each of you would recommend to our audience or perhaps just one or two that you think would be a good starting point 
uh, for workers or small businesses. So um, open, okay, Marty, perhaps, yeah. Well, the, the microphone um, you, is at the lectern, so perhaps you have to. Okay. Um, I think I provided a list of resources. Um, I think a great starting point is uh, Heads Up because it's overseen by Beyond Blue. It doesn't just have Beyond Blue's information, it has a whole lot of information from other organisations as well. Uh, but there's key areas about how to create a mentally healthy workplace, how to support your own mental health and wellbeing, how to support others in the workplace that may be stressed and struggling. Uh, but there's also some really good free online tools and resources that you can tap into. Uh, so for example, uh, there's one about how to have a conversation uh, where you see, you may, you see someone struggling in the workplace and then you see a manager or colleague going about and having that conversation. Uh, so I think there's uh, some really good information there. Um, look, I just want to highlight one of the other resources that um, Marty mentioned, which is a head for business. I think the um, what might sit underneath this question is, in fact, the challenge that many small businesses face, which is that some of the resources that are designed actually aren't a great fit for small business. They might work really well for corporates with um, big HR departments or a uh, strong focus on uh, uh, work, uh, work health and safety, but that can be really challenging in a small business environment. So I think Ahead for Business is really focused and targeted on the needs of small business, and it uses a, a strategy of providing great content, of course, but also a lot of case studies, so that you get to see how individual small businesses, sole traders, have managed and adapted some of the uh, you know, some of the issues that they're really relevant to them. And I think that learning has been really helpful for a lot of small businesses. Uh, I was just going to mention uh, one a good resource if you're looking at the uh, aspect of what I was speaking about in the relationship of musculoskeletal disorders and looking at um, psychosocial factors in the in the workplace and it's a tool uh, that was developed from La Trobe University through their um, organisation called Affirm. It's A P H I R M uh, toolbox and what it does it is it looks at identifying both the physical and the psychosocial factors uh, to um, look at, at both of those have, starting to have that conversation about the relationship with musculoskeletal disorders. Uh, so if anybody wanted to reach out and contact me I could happily get you in contact with um, them in using that program to support those measures. Fantastic, thank you. Some very uh, useful suggestions there. I'm going to try and actually look at the camera for once because I'm not sure that I've done that a single a single time today. I, I'm distracted by the the shiny image of myself in the screen, which is a terrible admission, but it's true. Uh, okay, so another question for the actually before we move on, I might just mention one particular resource. Um, David touched on the lack of resources for small businesses that are designed for small businesses. There's one in particular. Um, that's produced by the Queensland Safety Regulator, Work Health Safety Queensland, and it's entitled Psychological Health for Small Business, a fantastic resource. resource. It's all of six pages, and it talks about the common organisational psychosocial risk factors. And what I really like about it, at the rear of the document, it has some very uh, useful practical tips, do's and don'ts around how to address each organisational risk factor. So a very useful uh, resource for small businesses, freely available from the Work Health Safety Queensland website. So I just thought I'd mention that one. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, what initial steps of action would each of you recommend to a business who wants to create positive change in their workplace by proactively addressing psychological health and wellbeing? So we have touched on this a little bit, but perhaps just a few suggestions just in terms of getting started. Um, I think that um, uh, definitely if you have a look at the, the research, it says that it's really important when you're looking at creating a mentally healthy workplace um, is to make sure you've got critical success factors in place. And what they mean by that is really making sure that you've got management commitment on board. Uh, that's really, really important. Um, and management being visibly uh, uh, showing that visible commitment. Uh, so talking about mental health and wellbeing as, as I talked about before. 
The other thing is really getting your staff on board, really consulting with your staff about what's important to them uh, from a health and wellbeing perspective and taking those ideas on board where you can. Um, and I think the other thing is to have really good communication. So if you're going to build some ideas or an action plan or some areas that you're going to address in relation to mental health and wellbeing, how can you make sure that you can communicate that to everyone within the business, whether they be in the office or be working from home, or, or maybe they're uh, working in more sort of isolated type environments. So really building a good communication strategy so everyone knows about the health and wellbeing program and how they can tap into it and utilise it uh, for their benefit and for the benefit of their team and their business as well. Thanks, Marty. I agree with all those um, points. I think the only other one that I'd add is we're big advocates for measuring the organisational wellbeing. So I spoke about being able for an individual to be able to measure their current state of mental health. We can also aggregate those um, results to see how is the organisation as a whole um, at a point in time. I think um, this notion of sort of what gets measured gets done, knowing where the starting point is, where um, which groups are highlighting some risk factors, um, that data can be quite valuable in, in helping to then craft an action plan or KPIs or a strategy. So I think um, measurement is, is an important part of that process. Great, thank you very much. Some very useful information there. Um, a final two questions, kind of a two a two parter. I'll read them both aloud. So, uh, how would you go about creating lasting change in the workplace with regards to uh, new psychological health and wellbeing initiatives? And uh, Monique, you touched on this briefly, but how would you measure the impact of any new psychological health and wellbeing initiatives? I think I think with lasting change, um, I think it's really what I talked about before. I think that if you can really looking at, look at embedding it uh, in existing systems, I think it's a way to have that lasting change. So think about the way that you do your business now and how health and wellbeing can be integrated as part of that business. So if you've got a business plan, can we put health and wellbeing as part of that business plan? Uh, if we've got staff meetings, can we build it into our staff meetings? Um, and I think the other thing that I um, really like is what I've seen work really well um, is where businesses every year, they've actually surveyed staff or asked staff uh, about what's important for their health and wellbeing. They've introduced some initiatives, but at the end of the year, they've done a stock take about what they've done. And as a business, they've celebrated those successes. And, th and that way it keeps the momentum going as well. Um, and finally, I think the other point is to think about, and part of this is embedding, is having wellbeing champions within your business. Uh, I think just about every business has got someone or um, some people that are really passionate about health and wellbeing. So it's really being able to uh, harness that energy um, and being able to identify those people, being able to have those champions uh, within the business and to really be able to support those champions as well. So they're just some ideas as far as embedding it. Uh, within your business. Uh, yeah, look, I just really want to endorse what Marty's saying. That notion of embedding it into the culture of the organisation uh, is the only way that things are sustainable over the long term. I think for a lot of organisations who might be unclear about where to start, there is a temptation to go down the path of ticking boxes by putting people through training and then leaving it at that. I think the evidence really does show that that's not enough. So it's the, it's the strategies that organisations and businesses use that make health, wellbeing, mental health part of the culture of an organisation uh, over the long term that generate the greatest outcomes and benefits. So that actually means doing some of those things that Marty talked about, ensuring that health and wellbeing is part of the systems and processes uh, and policies of an organisation and that culturally 
that it's acknowledged that this is the way we do our business. And that's both top down from leadership and management as Marty indicated, but also bottom up so that workers are supported and engaged and have time to actually um, uh, explore how they can use uh, strategies around health and wellbeing and mental health uh, in their work. And that's an important issue because it has resource implications for business. So there's some of the things that I'd really encourage businesses to consider. In terms of evaluation, Monique's already talked about this, um, but evaluation is a bit like a piece of string. It can be really big and complex or it can be really small and tight. I would encourage uh, organisations who want to test how this is playing out um, for individual workers or teams to look at um, a really simple evaluative technique called most significant change. Uh, if you Google most significant change, you'll come up with a whole body of work on how to do it. It's very simple. Fundamentally, it asks individuals across all levels of an organisation to identify the most significant change that has come out of an intervention, like a mental health or wellbeing intervention. Really practical, really useful, generates lots of great qualitative information. So that would be some of my recommendations. Fantastic, some very useful information there to come from each of our presenters. Uh, we did have a question come in with regards to the resources that have been mentioned throughout each presenter's component. We will uh, collate a list of resources that we will send out to attendees. Uh, so we will make that available to you. I don't think that we've had any additional questions come in, so we might uh, we might leave it there, I think. So I'd like to uh, offer my sincere thanks to each of the panel members. Thank you to David Kelly, Monique Newberry, Heidi Turbull, and Marty Weber. Uh, thank you to my colleague James for uh, sorting out the tech today. It was our uh, first experience using this platform and, and so far so good. Uh, we hope that you've gotten something out of this. Again, please remember that it's being recorded and it will remain available online if you'd like to recommend it to a colleague or another business. If you think that they get something out of it, if they're passionate about safety, interested in psychological health and well-being, uh, they want to improve the culture within their workplace, perhaps, um, I'm certain that they'll get something out of this webinar. So thank you to our audience. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we hope that you've gotten something out of this National Safe Work Month event brought to you by Safe Work SA. And again, thanks to each of our panel members and presenters. My name's Jason, and uh, thank you for your time.